Hello board game brothers and sisters, I'm Adam Singer and welcome to another episode where I'll be letting you know of all the board games launching on Kickstarter and GameFound over the next week. If you're new to the channel, we do this every week going over all the upcoming campaigns, so if you want to stay up to date, this is definitely the place to be. You can subscribe down below, but before we get started, I do like to cover some new news and announcements that I just found out about over the past week. And I do just have one thing that I want to cover, and that's that the Guards of Atlantis 2 board game is going to be launching again, this time on GameFound. And the reason I'm mentioning this one is because this is a very highly regarded game with a rating of an 8.8 .8 over on Board Game Geek, and this game has been out for a while, so the majority of these ratings are from people that have actually played the game. And this is a game that I was really excited about during its last campaign, and I have backed it, but unfortunately I haven't had a chance to play it yet, so I can't really speak to my own opinion on what I think about the game, other than I was interested enough to back it myself during its previous campaign. And there's not a whole lot of info over on their campaign page right now, but if you're wondering what sort of changes there's going to be from the previous campaigns and the previous version of the game, it looks like that there's not going to be any rules changes, but there will be a little bit more new content, probably some promo cards or just some small expansions, because somewhere in the comments here they also mentioned that there's not going to be any stretch goals, so it looks like this is mostly delivering what has already been released in the past, just giving you another opportunity to get your hands on it. Other than that, I just want to mention that tracking all these upcoming campaigns is no easy task, so I do work with Alex over at Board Game Code, make sure that we're providing you the most up-to-date info as possible, and I do these videos every week but he does them every month so if you want to also show him some love you can go ahead and subscribe to his channel because he also provides some quality coverage and it's all a lot different than the coverage that I tend to offer and you can check them out in the description below but we do have quite a few games to jump into this week so let's check them out and the first campaign we have launches on January 23rd, and this one's called Trolls and Princesses. And this plays two to four players competitively and takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play. And in this game, players are going to be playing as different clans of trolls. There's four different clans to choose from, and you're going to be competing to try and win the favor of the Troll King. And this does borrow the theme from Scandinavian lore, where trolls are not so big and brainless. Instead, they're more like troublemakers that have their own lifestyle up in the mountains, where they'll be raising sheep and agriculture, but they do make their ways into the city mostly to use their troll magic to cause trouble with the humans and exploit them for their gold and resources. And this is a Euro style game where players are going to be performing their actions through worker movement, which means that you're going to have to move your worker from one place to another following some movement rules in order to perform the action that's available to you at that location. And there's two different areas where you can perform actions. There's your own personal cave board that will have a few starting areas where players will be moving around in order to perform those actions. But you can also purchase new cave tiles that you can use to expand your board, adding new rooms to your caves and adding more opportunities for different actions, different combinations of actions or even just new opportunities to score victory points. Since this is a worker movement game, the different actions that you put adjacent to each other will make those actions more easily attainable after you've performed one or the other. So that really allows you to decide which actions you want to easily chain together. But then there is the shared board where players can perform actions in the village and they can do different things like swap their troll babies with human babies, fooling the humans into raising their troll babies as their own, or you can lure different humans or princesses back to your troll cave in order to use them as bargaining chips for victory points. And as I said, you'll be able to use your troll magic along the way to help with all these efforts to do things like disguise yourself or distort the vision of the humans so that you can cause more mischief. I don't have too much more info on how the game plays right now. Now, but if you want to know more you can check out their campaign page which I've linked in the description below. And the next campaign we have also launches on the 23rd and this one's called Deep Shelf and this plays one to four players and takes about 90 to 120 minutes to play and I did cover this campaign in a previous video but it got pushed back until now but this was a game that I was really interested in. It looks like the designer really does know what they're doing and I guess I'll just go ahead and show you all that and roll the footage now. This is coming from the same publisher that created a game that you might know as Dinogenics, which was a bit of a sleeper hit. I didn't know what to expect when I first heard about it, but this is a game that a ton of people really like. A lot of people have heard about this game and you might have even recognized it as well as soon as I said it, but I don't think many people know about this publisher or recognize this publisher's name. So I think this one could potentially also be another sleeper hit. There's not a whole lot of games released by this publisher yet for them to really have a track record of quality games, but just from looking into the game, play of this one, I think it does look like a solid game. In this game, players are playing as corporations harvesting resources from the 
ocean floor. And players are going to have to balance how greedy they want to be because you will have an impact on the ecosystem, which is going to speed up the end of the game. The neat thing about this game is that there are three main paths to victory, but they all kind of stack on top of each other. You can either go for metal extraction, which is used for building your network throughout the ocean, and it's also used for research and can also just be converted into victory points. And the second way is through your research progression, and you can advance this by constructing labs and then performing research to advance your ecology, mineralogy, or zoology. And doing this will give you an immediate reward, but it can also give permanent upgrades. Making new discoveries by extracting unknown species from the ocean floor is also another way to move your research progression up, and you're going to be gaining victory points for moving up that research track. And the final main way to gain victory points is through area control by having the most structures in each of the three sections of the main board. And one thing that really stood out to me on the design on this one and how I know that the designer really knows what he's doing is because this does have quite a few really neat catch-up mechanics. Anytime a player advances in any of their tracks, it's going to give positive benefits to the other players. But then there is also a sea monster that's protective of the ocean floor and it's going to cause havoc to the greedy players and it will be able to be moved around, usually by the players that are being less greedy. In each turn, players are going to be choosing two actions to perform from their individual player boards. Each player board will have the same actions, but they might be a little bit different from player to player. And you can use any action that's available to you, but you can never use one of the actions that were used in a previous turn, so there's always going to be two actions that are out of bounds. And these actions allow you to do different things like move your submarine around on the board and scout for new tiles, gain income, construct buildings or vehicles, or move those vehicles around on the board, extract resources, refine ore, or conduct research. And the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. And if you want to check out the campaign page for yourself, I have links in the description below. And launching on January 23rd is Perdition's Mouth Abysmal Rift, and this plays 1-6 to six players cooperatively and takes about 30-180 to 180 minutes to play. And if you're not familiar with this game, this was a game that was released previously, and this is going to be a revised edition of that game. But the reason for this campaign is mostly to make it a little bit more available in North America, because this has been a very difficult game to find, at least in this part of the world. But before I get too far ahead of myself, I just want to let you know that this is still not going to be a super easy game to get, because this campaign campaign is only going to be able to offer 100 pledges, so if you are interested in this game or if you've been looking forward to this game, or if this does end up sounding like a game that you might end up wanting to back, you definitely want to head over to the pre-launch page and click notify me on launch to make sure that you're giving yourself the absolute best chance of securing a pledge. But if you're not familiar with this game, this is a challenging cooperative dungeon crawler that offers a scenario-based campaign where your items, injuries, and decisions do carry forward. Each player is going to be playing as their own unique asymmetrical hero equipped with their own unique power and deck of multi-use cards, and you'll be able to use these cards on your turn either to boost a specific action, or you can discard any of these cards to give a minor boost to any action. And the way that players perform actions on their turn is by spending action points in order to move around the rondelle, and then also spending whatever remaining action points they have to actually perform that specific action. And if you spend too many action points moving around the rondelle, that could leave you with too few action points left over to effectively perform the action that you're trying to perform. But what I think is really interesting about the rondelle is you're actually going to be skipping over any spaces that another player currently occupies, which means that you're going to be discounting your movement around the rondelle as long as they're not on an action you want to perform. Form, so this could work against you or for you depending on how well the players are coordinating. And the enemy's activation works very similar to this using their own rondelle, but instead you're going to be drawing a card to determine how many positions you're going to be moving around that rondelle, and then also how many actions are going to get performed. And you only have to do this once on the enemy's turn because this single activation will activate all the enemies currently out on the board. And of course players will be doing all of this to try and survive, but then also complete whatever objectives are specific to the scenario that they're currently playing. And if the players are able to fulfill those objectives before they're wiped out, then the players win the game and they can move on to that next scenario. And like I said, if you're interested in this one, you'll definitely want to click that notify me on launch button to make sure that you get notified because there's only 100 pledges available for this game. And of course you can find links to this campaign and any others that I mentioned in the description below. And the next campaign we have is launching on January 24th, and this one's called Batman Escape from Arkham Asylum. And this plays 1-5 to five players and takes about 30 minutes to play. And this is a campaign that was supposed to launch quite a while ago, but there were some delays for reasons outside of these creators' control. And because of those reasons, they decided it was most responsible to delay the campaign until now. 
and I'm glad to see it return, especially for any DC fans out there, because this is going to allow you to play as the villains as you try to escape Arkham Asylum and try not to be thwarted by any heroes that happen to show up. But because this is a campaign that I did cover in the past, I already do have footage explaining how this game plays, so I'll just go ahead and roll that footage for you now. And this is a semi-cooperative game where players are playing as the villains. Players are going to be trying to devise a plan, avoid the guards, trigger alarms, make split-second decisions, betray their friends, and escape Arkham Asylum before Batman arrives. And this is described as a dungeon crawler where the main villains are the Joker, Harley Quinn, Two-Face, the Penguin, Bane, Poison, and Ivy and the Scarecrow. At the start of the game, players will draw a plan card and that's going to define the conditions of the map. So it's going to dictate the number of rooms and corridors that must be placed and the special effects and scenario specific surprises that go along with that plan card. Players will build the map from the modular tiles and hexagons which represent the rooms and corridors and each player will also draw an event card at the start of the game and that's going to set some unexpected situations that the players have to address throughout their adventure. Players will have to to join forces to achieve their common goal of escaping the asylum, but they're also going to have their own hidden objectives that may put players at odds with their escape and might cause some seemingly irrational decisions or perhaps completely pit them against the other players. And each round is going to have two phases. There's the player phase and the adversary phase. And during the player phase, players will draw another event card, and then they're going to take turns performing different actions to move around the board, search different rooms, craft crazy weapons and tools to help aid them in their escape. And some of these will be more difficult to complete than others, requiring multiple characters to complete. Players can attack guards and other enemies as well as some different bosses, but any bad decisions will raise the alert level. And if that reaches its maximum alert, then Batman's gonna come and pay you a visit attacking the most successful villain. Each character and boss will also have its own character card with its own special abilities. And when all the players have performed their actions, the event cards that they took at the beginning of the game will develop some random events, normally negative ones, and they will have to overcome those circumstances in order to win the game. And then we have the adversaries phase, and this is a really interesting phase because players are going to change their roles and play as their own adversaries. This is going to allow the players to have some control over their enemies, and you might have to attack some of your own team, but there'll also be some opportunities to mislead wardens and guards to help aid you in your escape. Battle in this game is resolved using dice rolling, and there's three different types of dice that can be found throughout the game. And those different types of dice are going to range in their effectiveness and the amount of risk you have when rolling them. The game ends once all players have either been defeated or have escaped the asylum, but escaping isn't quite enough to win the game because you're also going to have to gain enough infamy points. And if you're interested in this campaign, make sure you don't forget to check out the link in the description below that will link you over to the game found page, because if you follow along before the campaign actually launches, you'll get an additional Bane character added to your pledge completely for free. And now also launching on the 24th, we have a campaign that I thought was launching last week. So I also already covered this one, but this is for Hero Realms Dungeons. And since I just covered this one last week, I don't have a whole lot more to add to this campaign. So I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. And this is an expansion for the game Hero Realms, which plays two to four players and takes about 20 to 30 minutes to play. And if you're not familiar with this game, this is a deck building game. And in this game, you're going to be starting out with your starter cards. And on your turn, you're allowed to take as many actions as you're able. And you'll be using those actions to play cards from your hand in order to gain gold or attack power or perform special effects or even draw more cards into your hand. You'll be able to spend any of your gold in order to buy new cards from the shared market. These are going to go immediately into your discard pile. And since this is is a deck building game that will eventually get shuffled up and then reused as your draw pile when you go to draw new cards into your hand. Any attack power that you're able to draw, you'll be able to spend in order to inflict damage on any of your opponents. But then at the end of your turn, you're going to be discarding any cards that are unplayed and left in your hand, as well as any action or item cards that you played out on the table. This means that some other cards, like your champion cards, will actually remain in play and be able to be used on future turns until they are discarded for other reasons. This new expansion is going to be adding six new character classes, including an alchemist, a barbarian, a bard, a druid, a monk, and a Kickstarter exclusive 
exclusive necromancer. There's also going to be specific adventure packs with the skill and ability tree cards for each of these characters to fully incorporate them into the game. There's also a brand new 80 card market deck for PvP and cooperative play, and you can choose to use this market deck on its own or to integrate it with your previous content. But this expansion is also going to bring in a brand new game board as well as a all new 12 encounter dungeon campaign for 1 to 5 players. And if you're interested in this one, I don't have the link to the campaign page yet, but you can go ahead and sign up for updates on their website and they'll send you an email as soon as that's available. Also launching on the 24th, we have Zoo Vadis, and this plays 3 to 7 players and takes about 20 to 40 minutes to play. And this is a re-implementation of the game by Reiner Knizia known as Quo Vadis. And I think this is a really good example of how to do a re-implementation because they are making quite a few significant changes to this game. A lot more than just the theme and artwork, although I do appreciate that as well. But I think they're adding enough to make the game a little bit more exciting and a little bit more fun and play a lot better at the different player counts. And some of these new changes include adding a new neutral character to the board that all the players will be able to influence through bribes. And this is the peak character. And with the addition of this neutral character, they're able to make some small tweaks to the board in order to balance it for all player counts, but then also make the main board extensible with the second board to open it up to be played with six to seven players as well, which wasn't possible with the previous iteration of this game. And each animal in this game also has their own asymmetrical ability as well, which probably doesn't work in the way that you expect, and I'll get back to that in a minute here. But there's also going to be some special victory point tokens added to the game as well that if you happen to pick those up, you'll gain those victory points, but then there'll also be a special action associated with it that you'll be able to perform as soon as you pick up that token. And as I mentioned before, this game is featuring a brand new theme along with brand new artwork that looks massively better than the previous version of this game. And to go along with that, we also have way better components with the meeples and tokens that you can see here, but I'm sure they're not limited to only what you can see in this image. And the way this game works is that each player is going to be controlling their own animal faction of a single type of animal. And what the players are trying to do is earn the title of the zoo mascot. And in order to do that, you have to get at least one of your meeples into the star exhibit. But then for all the animals that were able to get into that star exhibit, only the one with the most victory points of that set of animals is going to be the one that earns the title of the zoo mascot. And the way that players get their meeples to the star exhibit is that all the players are going to be starting with their meeples at the bottom of the board, and then you're going to be moving from exhibit to exhibit, crossing the paths between them, and picking up any of the victory point tokens that you happen to cross over. Anytime that you pick up a victory point token, you're replacing it with a random one from the supply, and the game continues like this until there's no room in that star exhibit and the winner is determined. But on a player's turn, you can perform one of four actions, and all players initially start the game with no animals out on the board. So of course, that is one of your actions that you can choose from, is to just place an animal to the bottom of the board in that first exhibit. But if you do have animals out on the board already, you might want to perform the action that allows you to advance that animal up the board. But the catch here is that in order to move from one exhibit to an adjacent exhibit, you actually have to have a vote, and you have to earn the majority votes in order to do so. Each exhibit has a certain number of spaces that players can occupy and each of these spaces represent a seat and you can try to get as many of your own animals into the same exhibit in order to increase your voting power but oftentimes you'll probably find yourself in an exhibit with other players characters and you might be wondering why would they ever want to vote to allow you to move forward when that mostly benefits you and there are a couple reasons for that first of all anytime that another player votes yes they're going to be gaining a victory point token but then the other reason is negotiation and negotiation is is a huge aspect of this game. You can pretty much negotiate whichever terms you want in order to try and convince your opposing players to vote yes to allow you to move forward. But keep in mind that the only binding contracts are ones that you can fulfill immediately. Any future promises don't have to be kept, so you might want to tread lightly there. But if you're not one to negotiate with the other players, there is another option here with the introduction of the neutral peacocks, because if you do have a peacock in the exhibit that you're currently in, then you can pay a token of two victory points or higher in order to earn the vote of that peacock. And one thing to note in this game is that none of your tokens can be broken down into change. So if you're paying a token of a higher value, you do not get changed back and you're just spending a higher value to get the same result. 
And another thing to note in this game is that you can't combine tokens in order to make a larger token of an equal value. So if you are bribing the peacocks, you have to give them a token of two or higher. They will not accept tokens lower than a value of two, even if the tokens you have add up to it. But if you don't have the tokens to bribe the peacocks and you don't have the votes from the other players, there is still one very last way that you can move over to the next exhibit, and that is with the help of the zookeeper. And the way that the zookeeper works is that they can move to any of the paths between the exhibit bits out on the board and when they're on that path they're going to be covering the victory point token on that path. This means that if you are on an adjacent exhibit you can move through the zookeeper absolutely for free but unfortunately you do not gain the victory point token when doing so. And this is a good segue into the other two actions that you have available on your turn and that is to either move the zookeeper to a new path which you can use to your advantage to allow you to move freely between the exhibits or you could even move the zookeeper to cover up a token that you think might be really valuable valuable to another player. And the fourth and final action is to move one of the peacock tokens, and these move similar to the character's animals where they have to move between adjacent enclosures, but you do get the added benefit of gaining one victory point anytime that you decide to move a peacock. And the game continues like this until the end game condition is met and then the player with the most victory points wins the game. But I did mention that I would come back to the asymmetrical character powers and the way that they work in the game. And each of these abilities are represented by tokens that you can find on top of each player's player screen. And this is an interesting part of the game because you do not actually get to use your own special ability. And the reason that these are tokens is because you actually use these as bargaining chips in the game. So if you're trying to negotiate with the other players, you might want to offer them up one of your special abilities in order to sweeten the deal. But you'll really want to consider when you agree to these terms because you only have a certain amount of these abilities available for the entire game and as soon as you give away one of those tokens you never get it back. And I really love this addition to the game, especially since this game is so negotiation heavy. This is just adding another dynamic to the negotiation, which plays such a giant role in the game. And as I mentioned before, I really do think this is a great example of how to reimplement a game because they have taken the core concepts of the game, but added a lot more to it in a way that I think makes the game a lot more fun and makes it a lot more accessible to more players with the upgraded theme and components. And I think these changes to the game are really well thought out and are bringing some uniqueness to the game that I think is very welcome. So if you are interested in this one, you can find a link to the campaign in the description below. And also launching on the 24th is another game that I think looks super interesting, and this one is called Witchbound. And this plays a single player and takes about 30 to 90 minutes to play, but this is a campaign style game where you're discovering and making decisions, and I don't see any reason why you couldn't play this in conjunction with another player or even multiple players in order to help make those decisions together and solve the puzzles that this game offers. And the way that this game works is that players are going to be exploring the world through a location booklet. Each of the pages offers an isometrical view of that location, and players will be able to enter interact with different areas of that image depending on the numbers that they find there. And if on that page you see a letter followed by a number, that means that you can look up that reference in the location booklet and that will lead you to a new location. So for example, if you wanted to go into this building here, you could just turn to the page with M07 in your location booklet and that will bring you to that new location. But you can also see some other options as well up here with M03 and then M02 in the bottom corner that will take you to those different respective locations. But any numbers on the page that don't have a letter associated with it are an opportunity for you to interact with that location on the page. And this is my absolute favorite part of the game because I really love how this works because you're going to have your own set of actions out on your own player sheet. You'll be able to expand those throughout the game, but then each of your actions also will have a number associated with them. So let's say that speak was associated with the number one, then you would combine your speak action number with the number that you see on the page in order to create a new number. So in this example, if you were to speak to this character, you would combine those into 138. And then you'll just look up that number in the campaign booklet and that will tell you the outcome of that action. But another interesting aspect here is that this also expands to any items or spells that you might find throughout the game because those will also have a number associated with them just like the actions and in exactly the same way you can combine those with the different numbers that you find out on the board to get a different outcome. So for example, let's say that you're able to capture some sort of rare bug in the game you might want to come back to this character here with the bug net and then combine the number associated with that bug with the number that is in his speech bubble in order to see what sort of outcome will come of that. Each of the locations can also have some hidden numbers scattered throughout the page, for example on this message board, and depending on what you're interacting with there might be some limitations with the available actions that you could perform there. And of course the results can vary depending on which action you decide to perform, as well as what actions you've already performed in other areas of the game. But of course not 
not all the locations you visit will be quite as safe as a town or shop, and any of the locations that you visit that have some sort of danger associated with them will have an encounter letter located at the bottom of that page. And whenever you see that, you're going to go through the encounter deck and find the letter matching the one on the page. Then that's going to reveal what sort of enemies you're going to be encountering there. And each of these enemy cards can also depict different numbers that are associated with that enemy, and the enemy can also change between different numbers depending on how you interact with them. And these numbers work very similar to the numbers that you find out on those location pages because you're going to be combining those numbers with your spells, items, or weapons in order to interact or attack that enemy. And some of these combinations will work better than others, while other combinations might not work at all. And you'll find that out when you go to look it up in the campaign booklet and it tells you whether or not you were successful in your attack, or instead if you happen to take some damage, or perhaps something completely different. And some of your attacks might require you to roll a die to determine whether or not you're successful, but you can always spend a focus to guarantee its success, but of course those are a limited resource and you won't want to be using those for every single encounter. And if this one sounds interesting to you, you can go ahead and find the link in the description below and you'll definitely want to follow along before the campaign launches because if you do and you do decide to back this campaign, then you'll get the downloadable content added to the pledge in a physical version completely for free. And launching on the 24th, we have Manhattan Project War Machine and this plays one to four players and takes about 30 to 60 minutes to play. And if that name does sound familiar to you, that's because there are a bunch of Manhattan Project games out already. And this game is not meant to be a continuation of that series, but rather an introduction to it. So this game is a little bit simpler than the other games in the series, and it's designed to introduce new players into what this series offers. And the main mechanism in this game is dice action selection. And the way that this game works is that each player is going to have their own personal player board, but then there's also going to be a main board where players will be performing their actions during their turn. And each player's player board is going to have a warehouse section where they can keep track of how many of each type of resource that they currently own. And then there's going to be a building section where players can add different buildings that they're able to build throughout the game. But players will also start the game with a special ability that they can use, as well as an objective card that they can try to achieve for additional victory points. And on a player's turn, you're going to be rolling the dice that you have access to, and you can re-roll these dice up to three times, but each time you roll them, you do have to keep one die. And depending on the icons that you roll, that's going to determine which actions you can perform. You'll then be able to split up your dice in order to perform whichever actions you decide, but then any of the actions that you choose are also going to give every other player at the table a smaller version of that action. Most of these actions have to do with gaining resources or converting resources into other resources, but if you do have enough resources, you can also perform the action to build a building. And as I mentioned before, when you do build a building, it gets added to your own personal player board. And the reason that's so important is because once you've performed all your actions, all your dice come back to you, and if you do have buildings available, you can actually place those dice on a building on your personal player board in order to take an additional action. So the more structures that you're able to build throughout the game, the more opportunities you'll have to activate them and get additional bonuses. And this is a really neat mechanism where players will be able to build different buildings from game to game, creating a very different engine. And of course, the player with the most victory points at the end of the game wins the game. And also launching on January 24th, we have Storm Dragons. This plays two to four players and takes about 15 to 30 minutes to play. And this is a competitive card game where you have two types of cards. You're gonna have Storm cards and you're gonna have Dragon cards. At the start of the game, you split the entire deck between all the players evenly. And then at the start of each turn, you're gonna be drawing five cards into your hand. Whichever player has decided to go first is also gonna get the day token. Then they can decide whether to start the game on the night side or the day side. And I will come back to why that's important in a minute because on a player's turn you're going to be deciding to play one of the cards from your hand and you can either play a storm card or a dragon card. The storm cards play a little bit more simple because they just add additional strength to whatever cards you currently have in play but then you can only play up to three dragon cards and when you do that you're going to be playing whatever ability is on that dragon card and then assigning it to either the head the wings or the tail and the different dragon cards can have different strengths or abilities depending on where you decide to position them in that stack as well as depending on whether or not that token is flipped to day or night at that given moment. But anytime that a dragon card is put into play, all the players have to determine which player currently has the strongest dragon, and then they're going to be gaining the challenge token. And the reason it's really nice to have the challenge token is because if you have that token, you can trigger a challenge at any moment, and then whichever player has the highest strength in combination with their dragon and storm cards is going to be the winner of that round. And then at the end of the game, the player that has won the most dragon cards in the stack of cards that they're able to win is the winner of the game. And as always, I have links in the description below.
Also launching on the 24th, we have a roll and write, and this one's called Roll for the Great Ones, and this plays one to four players and takes about 60 to 90 minutes to play. And this one is a cooperative roll and write, and the way that this game works is that players are going to be rolling dice on their turn, and then each player is going to be choosing which die that they want to take for themselves, which is going to allow them to perform different actions on their own personal player sheet. But then after all the players have drafted their die, there's going to be a couple dice left over, and that's going to determine which action your enemy is going to get. So this is going to encourage players to work together more to try and decide which dice they want to take amongst themselves and in which order so that they're getting the most out of their turn as possible. Players are going to be using these dice to collect experience, learn more powerful abilities, and help beat the evil cultists before they can successfully perform their ritual. Each player is also playing as an asymmetrical investigator, so each player's player sheet will be a little bit different from the others. Unfortunately, there's not a whole lot more info on how this game plays, but if this one does sound interesting to you, you can find out more at the campaign page, which I'll have linked in the description below. And now on the 25th, we have Scrap, and this plays 2-4 to four players and takes about 45-150 to 150 minutes to play, and this is a competitive game where players are going to be pre programming their actions, always having two cards in play, one that you're going to be playing this turn, and then one that's pre-programmed for the next turn. And this is a campaign that I thought was launching last week, but it got pushed back until now, so I'll just go ahead and roll that previous footage for you now. And this is a competitive area control game that has zero randomness, so whether you win or lose, you can take full accountability for that. But in this game, players are going to be playing as different robots, and the way that this game works is that you're going to be pre-programming your actions for each turn. And you're always going to have two cards ready to go, the one that you're going to be playing on this turn, and then the one that you're going to be playing on the following turn. And of course, when you play the card on your current turn, since you always have to have two cards in play, you're going to be moving your next card forward and then queuing up the one after that. And whenever you reveal a card, you'll be able to perform the basic action on it for free, but you can also discard a card from your hand of the same type in order to activate its power-up ability. After you've done that, you'll be able to choose a row on the subroutine track and then move your token up on that track. And moving your token up on a track makes you stronger in that specific area and unlocks new cards to add to your hand and new abilities. And the game continues like this, and the player that is able to accumulate the most data by performing different actions or defeating their opponents wins the game and of course if you want to know more the link is in the description below and finally launching on the 27th we have the wilderness and this plays one to six players it takes about 45 to 150 minutes to play and this is a scenario based cooperative game where nature has taken back the cities and buildings that the humans have worked so hard to develop and this is a post-apocalyptic game where the predators in the animal kingdom have evolved to be even more of a threat and players will be using actions to move scavenge and attack the different beasts that they encounter and certain weapons will only be able to kill certain beasts and that will be outlined on the weapons that you gain but then you can also deconstruct weapons into their individual parts and then combine them back together or add them to existing weapons in order to upgrade them and during a scenario players will be trying to achieve certain objectives while also trying to survive and at the end of the scenario players can expect to go up against a final boss that's just going to dominate the map and plow through whatever it wants to try and get you not a whole lot more info on this one right now but if you want to know more i have links in the description below and that's everything I have for you this week, but don't leave yet because we have the first giveaway of the year, and this is going to be for Aegis Combining Robots Season 2, which is a standalone expansion to the content that they have already released. And if you're not familiar with this game, this is a tactical area control game where players are going to have a set of robots that they have out on the main board, and then players are going to be performing different actions with those robots, combining them together into even more powerful robots as the game develops and you try to defeat the other players. In order to combine two robots together, they need to be on adjacent spaces, but they also need to share certain tags, and depending on which tags those are, you can combine your robots into different combinations. But an interesting aspect of combining your robots is that any previous damage or debilitations that your robots had beforehand are completely wiped clean, and your new robot is created with full health and completely refreshed. So of course, strategically, this means that the best time to combine your robots is when your robots are on the verge of being destroyed. This means that you don't want to combine your robots too soon, but the longer that you wait, the more you're pushing your luck with one of those robots actually being destroyed. And the publisher did confirm that they would be donating a copy of the game for a giveaway, but they didn't specify which pledge or combination of content that they would be donating, so I expect that it'll probably be something along the lines of the second edition box along with the associated stretch goals, but I can't promise anything right now, but you will win something. 
And since this is going to be offered worldwide, anyone can leave a comment down below to get entered. And I'm not going to require any specific hashtag to get you entered into the giveaway. I'm just going to draw from all the comments collectively. But if you're not sure of what you want to leave in your comment, you can always let us know of two things that you think combine into something even better. I mean, like, I like ice cream and pies okay, but if you just put those two things together, you have something magical. And that's everything I have for you this week. Good luck in the giveaway, and I'm really glad that we're able to start these giveaways back up again. So thank you to the publishers that are donating pledges. And you can always jump into those every week, and we usually have multiple giveaways in a single week, which only increases your odds of winning. So feel free to subscribe if you want to maximize your odds, and it also helps support the channel and helps more people discover this channel. And I really do appreciate any support I can get, and I really do try to earn it with the content that I create here. So if you think I deserve it, there is a subscribe button down below, and I'd love to hit 10k in the first half of this year because that's just a cool milestone to hit but we'll leave that for one of the next videos so as always thanks so much for watching and until next time keep that shelf cluttered and the table full What? <laughs>